is that we need to be more committed to Scripture than we are to man's ideas. We need to be more committed to Scripture than we are to a movement. We need to be more committed to Scripture than we are to a movement. Uh, movements live and they die. Go, go read histories of movements. But the Word of God endures forever. It, it's, it's the incorruptible seed. Uh, the notes in a study Bible, they are not the incorruptible seed. They're not. Uh, so tonight, the message is this, Schofield versus Scripture. Schofield versus Scripture. Some of you are getting nervous because you thought Schofield was the 13th apostle. You're like, oh my goodness, how can we preach against Schofield? How can we preach against a Schofield reference Bible? I'm going to. How can we preach against the Schofield reference Bible notes? I mean, fundamental churches for decades have been using that. Okay, so I'm going to ask you tonight. Are you more committed to Scripture or to Schofield's notes? Um, there's a history, and, and I'm not going to get into all the nitty-gritty details, and frankly, I'm not as interested even in C.I. Schofield's background, though that's an interesting study sometime to find out who the man was. It's interesting. To say the least, it's interesting. But uh, the Schofield, the reason this is a big deal and the reason I need to take, I've never done this before, I've never taken one whole message and just preached on this. I've, I've touched on it last Sunday night. I touched on it three or four or five times. Uh, but the reason this is an important topic is that this reference Bible has had such a huge influence for decades in independent fundamental Baptist churches. And let me just say this, Schofield himself and Clarence Larkin, Clarence Larkin, you may know him by his end times prophecy charts, and C.I. Schofield, you would probably know him by his reference Bible. Uh, that Bible, C.I. Schofield himself, was influenced by a man named John Nelson Darby. I and mean, this is just a matter of record. This is just a matter of history. This isn't, hey, I, I'm, I'm, I just decided I was going to be out against somebody. This is a matter of record. Uh, John Nelson Darby of the Plymouth Brethren had a great influence upon C.I. Schofield. So C.I. Schofield put together his reference Bible. It was promoted and used in the Southern Baptist seminaries. And independent Baptist churches came out of the Southern Baptist Convention. We came out of it. And there's a reason we came out of it, by the way. And that'll be another topic for another night. The reason we're independent fundamental. Baptist church, a uh, Baptist church. But Schofield's Bible, his notes have had such an influence where preachers have conflated Scripture with his notes so much that they preach his notes without realizing they don't agree with Scripture. So folks, what, folks, what I'm saying, and, and uh, this could be a, a very long study, I'm going, to, I'm going to summarize it, and to me, what are some of the biggest errors here tonight? What I'm simply saying at the end of all of this, my goal isn't just to, to dance up and down on the Schofield Reference Bible notes so much, though that is one of my goals a little bit. But my goal more is that we really examine our own hearts. Am I more committed to Scripture or to a movement? Am I committed to a religion or to the Word of God? Am I committed to what some man has told me, or am I going to be as the church at Berea? I'm going to go search the Scriptures not the notes, the scriptures, to see if those things are so. That's what I'd ask the Holy Spirit to do in our own hearts tonight. Lord, speak to our hearts as I preach your word. Lord, you said one of the jobs of the preacher is to tear down some things and then to rebuild, to pluck up some things and then to plant. So tonight I pray that uh, you will help me to tear down confidence in a man as opposed to your scripture. I pray that you'll help me to build up faith in your word. Fill me with your spirit. Speak to our hearts. Give us what we need tonight in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to take the Schofield Reference Bible, and that's what this is. Um, it is a King James Schofield Reference Bible, so the word of God is in this book. It's in this book. This right here, this is the word of God. Right here, this is what I preach from. This is what I read from. This is the Word of God. It's actually nothing else but the Word of God. It, it's, a, it's a blank page, and 
the Word of God. There's no cross-references. There's no notes. I'm not against having books. I, like I said, I have lots of books. But I don't go to those books to find out what I believe. Um, someone asked me not long ago, a month, month and a half ago, they said, what, what's the best book I could read to teach me Baptistic doctrine? And I wasn't being facetious. I said, this book right here. I said, which book? This one. See, so get to know this book first. And then if you want to use another book, be careful but if you want to use another book and you know how to eat around the bones because you know this book well, okay. Paul did mention the parchments and the books, you know, so that he read other things too. But the point is this, uh, Scripture must be number one. It's a sad thing to read books and books and books about the book but not read the book. So I'm going to show you what in my estimation are some of the most blatant errors in Schofield's reference Bible. And it's not just for a matter of picking these out. It's because independent Baptist churches have adopted Schofield's notes as if they were Scripture. And they've been preaching them for years as if they're Scripture, and they're not. So does that mean that every note in here that he wrote is wrong? No, there are some things he writes that are exactly correct according to Scripture. But some of the most egregious doctrines preached, they just fly in the face of Scripture. So tonight I just want to start with a simple one. If uh, in the Schofield Reference Bible I'm going to read, it's page 4, and that's one reason a lot of churches use Schofield Reference Bibles because uh, the pages were always the same. So you could say instead of you know learning the books of the Bible and say, hey, turn to Ezekiel chapter 22, you could say turn to page 986, and people could just turn to page 986 and there it'd be. So that's one reason churches stuck with the Schofield Reference Bible. Uh, I've heard preachers that I know, the word, they, I know they know the Word of God. They say, yeah, the Schofield notes say this, but yet they're still preaching from the Schofield notes. Um, I want to read this first one from page 4. And this is Genesis chapter number 1. It's a note from Genesis 1 verse 5. And again, I, I want us to say, do we have to have some higher learning in order to understand the Word of God? Do we have to be, you know, uh, excellent in Greek and Hebrew to understand the Word of God? Do you have to have that? Do you, do you have to? Or can the Holy Spirit of God teach you? You know, the Bible actually says that no prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation. What does that mean? Nobody has a corner on the Bible. Uh, if you're willing to dig into the Word of God, you can learn what the Word of God says. No prophecy of the Scriptures of any private interpretation, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Well, I'm going to read this verse to you. And, you know, God's word is pretty straightforward. It says, when it's speaking of God creating light, it says, And God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day. And the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. So, what does that verse say? It says that God took one day to create the light. Do you believe that? Hello? Do you believe it? Do you need to explain that away? Do you need to help God out? God really didn't mean that, did he? I mean, how in the world do you create all that in one day? He did. He's God. If you read the rest of them, it says, you know, uh, God created the waters, God created the animals. Each one of those things he created in one day. That's what the Bible says. But uh, Schofield, he puts in the notes. And see, here's the problem with these notes. Man likes to be, the Bible calls it being heady and high-minded. Heady, high-minded. Folks, you couldn't possibly understand the Bible without me. I, I have a corner on the Bible. I know so much more than you do. So you have to learn my doctrine to understand the Word of God. Did God's Word just say He created it in the day, in a day? The evening and the morning were the first day. Is that one day? Sure it is. Okay, but Schofield's notes say, The use of evening and morning may be held to limit day to the solar day, but the frequent parabolic use 
In other words, there's a, there, there's more of, it's more like a parable. God didn't really mean day. He's speaking like it's a parable. The frequent parabolic use of natural phenomena may warrant the conclusion that each creative, in quotation marks, day was a period of time marked off by a beginning and ending. You know, th this has been called, it's been called the gap theory. That God really couldn't have done it all in one 24-hour day. And, and this, by the way, this is how people have tried to marry the Bible with evolution. You're not going to marry the two because they are opposite of one another. God literally created the earth in six literal days and he rested the seventh day. And the earth is not millions and millions and millions of years old. And we did not evolve and we did not come from a big bang. The earth is a relatively young earth, about 6,000 years old, that's proven. And there was a worldwide flood that created great catastrophes in a very short amount of time, folks. We don't need to help God out. We don't need to marry evolution with the word of God and say, it really didn't mean day, it meant a period of time. Because what that means is, hey, we got to give God millions of years to create the light. we got to give millions of years to create all the animals. Now, folks, if you hadn't have read Schofield's notes, would you have read that chapter and at any point said, that must mean millions and millions of years? Or would you have just read the Bible plain face value and said it means one day? It means one day. You see, a lot of preaching, we have to tear down a bunch of false doctrines that have been built up that have complicated truth. Truth is pretty simple. We have to spend a lot of time tearing down false doctrines that have been built upon man's notes rather than the Word of God. I want to read another one. Uh, page 921 in your Schofield Reference Bible. <laughs> no, I didn't always want to say that, actually. But Page 921. I want to say, turn in your Schofield Reference Bible to the usher walking up the aisle. He'll give you a new one. <laughs> okay. Uh, page 921. This one's, this one's going to hit home, especially if you haven't been around here much and heard what we've studied from the Word of God. Because this isn't what the news says or what most independent fundamental Baptist churches are preaching. But this is Bible. Schofield writes in Hosea chapter 1 a reference to Hosea 1.10, which this verse says this. It says, yet the number of the children of Israel shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be measured nor numbered. And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people. Listen to that. There it shall be said unto them, ye are the sons of the living God. Is that verse true? Oh, it's absolutely true. But then I want you to hear Schofield's notes. And for some of you, if you haven't dug into this, you're going to think his note is right. He writes, my people, in quotations, is an expression used in the Old Testament exclusively. Somebody tell me, what does exclusively mean? Does that mean there are any others? No, it means the only ones. He says, my people is an expression used in the Old Testament exclusively of Israel, the nation. Now, if you haven't studied that, that might sound right. You might go, oh, yeah, yeah, Israel's the people of God. Hold on. I want to look at what the Bible actually says, Scripture versus Schofield. First of all, let's, let's and, and I, I believe all the promises of the Bible are true, all of them. So I want you to go with me to Isaiah 19, please, and... I might confuse myself turning between two Bibles up here tonight. Isaiah 19, verse 23. And when we were studying the book of Isaiah, and we'll get back to that on Wednesdays eventually. Uh, we have one-third of the book to go. But when we're studying Isaiah, we dug deep into these verses. Isaiah 19, verse 23. There's some end times prophecy in here. And I want you to notice verse 23. It says, in that day... Shall there be a highway out of Egypt to Assyria? And the Assyrians shall come into Egypt, and the Egyptian into Assyria, and the Egyptians shall serve with the Assyrians. In that day shall Israel be the third with Egypt and with Assyria, even a blessing in the midst of the land, whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be, can you read the next three words for me? Egypt, my people. Say, Pastor, you're just being picky. No, I'm not being picky. One, it was an error for him to say that Israel exclusively, the physical nation of Israel, 
alone in the Old Testament is my people. But the reason it's such a big deal is there's a huge false doctrine built off of this called Zionism. And Zionism is the teaching that the physical nation of Israel today, that they are the people of God. Now, for some of you, this is all brand new, and you think I'm in heresy. But I'm going to tell you, go study your Bible. Not Schofield's notes, go study your Bible. Are you telling me the modern-day nation of Israel that's 20% Muslim, they're the people of God? So those Muslims, they're the people of God, too. Hello? Uh, they're, if they're Jewish by religion, they're the people of God. No, if you have not the Son, you don't have the Father. And as a matter of fact, the Jewish religion, they speak worse of Jesus Christ than Muslims do. They say Jesus is burning in hell, folks. And, and that's, that's the nice way to put what they have said. What I'm telling you is God's plan, it never changed. It's always been the same from the beginning. You're not the people of God because you live at a certain address or because you have a blue and white flag that flies above you or because you're of a certain blood type. How, how many of us in here do you think have some kind of, if you want to call it Jewish blood, mixed in? Folks, this is why the Bible says to avoid genealogies. Because we are so mixed and mingled in this world today. We're not the people of God because of our DNA. We're not. So right here, at the very least, would you agree that he's in error to say it only refers to the physical nation of Israel as God's people? Right here he called Egypt his people. Hold on, I thought Egypt's a picture of the world. Well, it is, but right here he said Egypt, my people. How is that possible? Well, because when God is talking about a nation, a nation that he will redeem unto himself, who is he talking about? He is talking about every believer from every physical nation. I don't care if it's the United States of America or if it's Israel or if it's Canada. You say, Pastor, that's replacement theology. You can call it whatever you want, and I'm telling you what I'm preaching to you is Bible. You can call what you want from Schofield's notes, and I'm telling you what God's Word says. Um, in fact, let's just go look at it since you asked, okay? Let's dig in. Matthew chapter 8. Look at Matthew chapter 8. You see, the, 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 uh, the misunderstanding in Jesus' day is the same misunderstanding today. The people in Jesus' day thought, we're the descendants of Abraham. We're the physical descendants of Abraham, so we are the people of God. And Jesus corrects that. He tells them, in fact, here's one example of this. Look at Matthew chapter 8, uh, verse number 10. When Jesus heard it, this is when the centurion, who is not a physical Jew, if you want to call him that, no, he had great faith. And so Jesus, when he heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. This man was not a part of the physical nation of Israel. And Jesus is saying, this man has great faith, and I haven't found that kind of faith in the physical nation of Israel. Now look at verse 11. And I say unto you that many shall come from the east and west, there we are, and shall sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, but the children of the kingdom shall be cast out into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. What in the world is Jesus saying? He's saying, I don't care what physical nation you're from. I am the headstone of the corner. If you reject me, you will be lost in your sin forever. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. I don't care what your DNA is or what your address is. Romans chapter 2. Let's go there, please. Look at Romans chapter 2. Say, oh, Pastor, you're talking spiritually. God was talking spiritually. This was God's plan from the beginning. God didn't offer the kingdom to Israel and then they refused him. By the way, you know where you get that from? The Schofield Reference Bible. God didn't offer the kingdom to Israel, and then they refused him, so God said, oh, here's plan B. No, this has been plan A. It's been the only plan all along. Man didn't fully understand it. God did dispense more and more knowledge and understanding, but this has been God's plan all along. Look at Romans chapter 2, verse 28. The Bible says, for he is not a Jew, which is one, what's the next word? Does God mean that? Does he mean that? Neither is that circumcision which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew which is one 
inwardly, and circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter, whose praise is not of men but of God. Go to Romans chapter 9. These are the, some of the most misunderstood chapters by those who lift up Zionism because they've read it in the Schofield Reference Bible. He must have been right. He's smarter than me. He has to be right, except it doesn't agree with the Scripture. Romans chapter 9, notice verse 6. Not as though the word of God have taken none effect. Paul himself is saying, I'm burdened for my people, the physical descendants, the, the physical nation of Israel. I'm burdened for them. I want them to be saved. Folks, don't you dare leave here and say, you're an anti-Semite. No, I'm not. I want everybody saved. I want everybody to come to Jesus Christ. Amen. And to me, you are an anti-Semite if you're telling somebody they have some special favor with God, even though they're rejecting Jesus Christ. You don't have any special favor with God. You must come through the Son, Jesus Christ. Verse 6, not as though the word of God hath taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. What in the world does that mean? It means not everybody who's a physical descendant is actually the Israel of God. When somebody asks me, are you, the, do you, are you for Israel? Or do you believe the people of Israel are the people of God? I said, which Israel? You talking about the physical nation of the, over there? No. No. Are you talking about every believer of every nation, including the modern-day nation of Israel? Yes, every believer. Notice verse 7. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. Remember when they said, we're, we're Abraham's seed, and Jesus said, look, God can take these rocks and raise up children unto Abraham. They were saying, we're the physical descendants. So you must come through Jesus Christ. Neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children, but in Isaac shall thy seed be called. That is, they which are the children of the flesh. Would you read the next sentence? See what the Bible actually says. They which are the children of the flesh, read it with me, these are not the children of God. Can you get any more plain than that? These are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Look at verse 24, please, of that same chapter. And now notice this. He's quoting what we read in the beginning from Hosea. In Hosea, when Schofield wrote, My people is an expression used in the Old Testament exclusively of Israel the nation, meaning the physical nation. He's going to quote that right here and read it in context, the fulfillment of that prophecy. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 24. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles, as he saith also in O.C., and that's Hosea. I will call them my people, which were not my people, and her beloved, which was not beloved, and it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, ye are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. Praise God. We are the people of God through faith in Jesus Christ. This is just scratching the surface. We could take... Weeks just studying this. It's all through the Bible. So how are people so confused? I'm going to tell you how they're so confused. Because they've taken notes over Scripture. It's just a whole lot easier to go say, well, what does this guy think? Oh, well, that must be right. I'm sure it is. Instead of actually digging in to see what he thinks, what he says. Um... Another issue I have with the Schofield Reference Bible, again, my emphasis tonight is, yes, to expose that there are a lot of problems in these notes, but more so for us to examine our own hearts, to say, am I more committed to a movement? Am I more committed to something a man has said or to the Word of God? Um, I never did get to Jeremiah, did I? Jeremiah 23, the prophet, the Lord told him, he said, he said, he that hath a dream, let him speak a dream. He that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat? He said, those prophets and their false dreams, those dreams are just the chaff. My word is the wheat. My word is like a hammer. It's like a, it's like a fire. It's like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. But those prophets, they were trusting their own words, their own feelings, their own visions instead of what God's word had said. And folks, we're, we can be guilty of the same thing today if we're not careful. So, um, the introduction to the Schofield Reference Bible, and by the way, most churches that are using this, uh, they believe the King James Bible is the Word of God. Guess what? So do I. It's the inspired, inerrant, infallible Word of God. And I'll do a series again on that someday again, because it's such an important subject. 
But I want you to hear C.I. Schofield's introduction. Page number three of the introduction. He says, after mature reflection, it was determined to use the authorized version. That's the King James Bible. None of the many revisions have commended themselves to the people at large. What does that mean? It's not real popular with the people. Well, that was back in 1909 when he wrote this. The revised version, which has now been before the public for 27 years, gives no indication of becoming in any general sense the people's Bible of the English-speaking world. You know why? We don't need another one. We don't need the hundreds that are out there. Is God really that confused? He's not. The discovery of the Sinaitic manuscript, and, and I know some of this gets down into the weeds of this, but this is important to know. Uh, there, there's this debate. Well, the Sinaitic manuscript and the Vaticanus, those are better manuscripts, and that's where the modern so-called versions of the Bible come from. The, the, word, the word of God does not come from those manuscripts. But here's Schofield saying, the discovery of the Sinaitic manuscript and the labors in the field of textual criticism. You know what that means? It means I'm going to get my scissors out and cut out of the text what I think doesn't belong there, and I'm going to get my pen out and add what I think does belong there. Folks, there's some warnings about that in the Word of God. The discovery of that manuscript and the labors in the field of textual criticism of such scholars as Griesbach, Lachman, Tischendorf, Trigelis, Weiner, Alford, and if you've studied this at all, these names will be very familiar to you, and Wes, Scott, and Hort, that's where all the modern so-called versions have come from. Wes, Scott, and Hort have cleared the Greek textus receptus of minor inaccuracies. Trust me, said Satan, while confirming in a remarkable degree the general accuracy of the authorized version of that text. You know, Jesus told me, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. I need an every word Bible. I don't need a Bible that I say, you know, that word doesn't belong, that one. No, I have the word of God. I have a place where I can find every word of God. Such emendations of the text as scholarship demands have been placed in the margins of this edition, which therefore combines the dignity, the high religious value, the tender associations of the past, the literary beauty, and remarkable general, general accuracy of the authorized version with the results of the best textual scholarship. So we had to help the Bible out. We had to help, help out God and you know, correct his mistakes. So we put those in the notes. C.I. Schofield, January 1st, 1909. I have a big problem with that. Uh, page 1023 in the Schofield Reference Bible. Uh, in the center column, listen to what it says, 1023. It's referring to this verse, Howbeit this kind goeth not out, but by prayer and fasting. This kind. Uh, someone just asked me about this verse this morning after church. You know what? That verse belongs there. That verse belongs there. It does. But Schofield, in all his wisdom, his high-minded headiness, said, the two best MSS, that means manuscripts, Sinaitic and Vaticanus, omit verse 21. The best ones don't have that verse there. I have a problem with that. Serious problem with that. Um... I don't just have a problem with that. I have a problem with it because God has a problem with it. He said that he would keep and preserve his word to every generation, folks. We have the word of God. Uh, no, let me turn to this note, note 1031. Note 1031 in the Schofield Reference Bible. Uh, note number S, letter S rather, says, The best manuscripts... Now, again, this is interesting. Omit verse 14. Here's what verse 14 says. Woe unto you, scribes and, and Pharisees, hypocrites, for ye devour widows' houses, and for a pretense make long prayer. Therefore ye shall receive the greater damnation. Oh, but the best manuscripts don't have that verse. I have a problem with that. Um, li listen to this one. In fact, if you would turn here, Mark 16... If you're familiar with this issue at all, you'll know where I'm going with Mark 16. 
um, page 1069 in the Schofield Reference Bible. And read with me. I mean, this is an amazing story. This might even be one of the passages. I'm sure it is. I'll preach down next month. Um, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Praise God. We serve a risen, living Savior. He's in the world today. He saved us. He's in this church. He owns this church. We're in His hand. He's in our midst. We need to remember that when we come to church. Um, he rose from the dead. Mark 16, it talks about how they came to the tomb and uh, they saw uh, the angels, notice uh, the young man, verse 5, sitting in the right side, clothed in a long white garment. They were affrighted, verse 6. And he saith unto them, Be not affrighted, you seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen, he is not here. Behold the place where they laid him, but go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall you see him as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. The end. No, oh wait, no, there's more. <laughs> there's more. Uh, Jesus appeared to two of them. Walk, he appeared to the eleven. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. But let me read Schofield's notes from this page. The passage from verse 9 to the end. So we stop with verse 8. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. The end. The passage from verse 9 to the end is not found in the two most ancient manuscripts. Now, just a little while ago, he said those are the two best manuscripts. He said those are the best. Sinaiticus, Vaticanus. The Sinaitic and Vatican and others have it with partial omissions and variations, but it is quoted by Arrhenius and Hippolytus in the 2nd or 3rd century. Folks, do those verses belong there or not? Do they belong there or not? You see, what this man has done is he has sowed doubt in the Word of God. So you go and you read Schofield's notes and you read what the Bible said, but you just believe you must have misunderstood because Schofield had it right. So you trust Schofield over Scripture if you're not careful. Oh, I'm telling you, this is a problem in our churches. This is a problem. Because we're not taking the plain word of God and believing it. We're believing Schofield notes over the word of God. I want to give you another example. Uh, in fact, go to, uh, if you would look at this one, go to Joshua 21. I'm going to read, going to read from page 250. And this is a popular teaching in end times prophecy because it plays into the Zionism and dispensationalism, which is a whole other subject I'm going to preach on one night soon. And I want you to hear what Schofield wrote in page 250. Uh, he said, The Palestinian covenant gives the conditions under which Israel, he's speaking of the physical nation of Israel, entered the land of promise. It is important to see that the nation has never as yet, I mean, that was 1909 when he finished this, but you know, this is what preachers are still preaching today. The nation, physical nation of Israel, has never as yet taken the land under the unconditional Abrahamic covenant, nor has it ever possessed the whole land. Now, if you believe that, then what you actually believe are Schofield's notes and every other parrot preacher who has repeated them. But God's word says the opposite. Uh, look at Joshua. You're there, Joshua 21. And uh, wait for me to get there. Look at Joshua 21, verse 43. It says, And the Lord gave unto Israel... What's the next word? We're in verse 43 of chapter 21. And the Lord gave unto Israel... All the land, which he swore. So, yeah, he gave it to them, but they didn't have it. Oh, no, let's keep reading. Keep reading, okay? And, and this is one passage of many. He gave unto Israel all the land, which he swore to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it. If you possess something, does that mean you have it? Wait a minute. Is, that, is this too difficult, or does it mean that? Does it really mean that? It really means that. 
They possessed it and dwelt therein. Now, did they run out all the people they should have run out? No, they did not. That's where their problem started. They joined up with the world. And that's why they were run out of that land. Verse 44, and the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. There failed not aught of any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. Read the next four words. All came to pass. Does it mean that really or doesn't it mean that? It means that. So why do you think they've never had their land? Because Schofield's notes said they don't. So which one are you going to believe? Because preachers have parroted and repeated that over and over and over and over and over again. Because it's easier to read Schofield's notes than it is to actually dig in what the Bible says. What I'm saying is, are you more committed to somebody's notes or to the word of God? God said he gave them all the land. They possessed all of it. You know what? God is right. Scripture's right. Schofield's wrong. Um, I'm going to go, go, go to this one place, if you would. Uh, this is very important. <laughs> go to Hebrews 10, actually, if you would, and we're going to end here tonight. There's so many other places we could go. I, I do want to expose the problems in this reference Bible, in the notes. You know, if I could right now tonight, I, I would do this if I could. If I had one half of this that were notes and the other half is Bible, I'd rip off the notes and throw them off the pulpit. I would. But I can't because there's Bible verses in mixed in here. That's what I'm saying, folks. We don't need man's notes. We need the Word of God. We need the Word of God. Um, this one is a serious problem. Now, there are several other errors that Schofield has in his notes. Again, you say, what's the big deal? The big deal is that it's a huge influence, a huge influence in churches. Many churches just preach Schofield, doctrines from Schofield, not from Scripture. It's a big problem. But none more so, and by the way, you know, where did the idea of, hey, there are seven uh, dispensations come from? Hey, if you ever just read the Bible, would you know there were seven dispensations? You know, if, but if you read Schofield's notes, that's how you, you know. <laughs> no. Um, we're in the Laodicean church age. Well, where do you get that in the Bible? Well, you actually don't get it in the Bible. You get it from Schofield's notes. So what's the problem with that? The problem with that is teaching that all churches at the end are just going to be like Laodicea. We just have to be lukewarm. That's what we have to be, folks, because we're in the Laodicean church age. Oh, no, no. There have been churches all along who've been like all seven of those churches. All along, right now. There are churches who are lukewarm. There are churches who are on fire for God. There's all the above. We don't have to be a Laodicean church. There's not a Laodicean church age. That's Schofield, not Scripture. Seven dispensations, that's Schofield, not Scripture. But none of them bother me as much. Well, the one about the Bible certainly does. But this one bothers me, I should say, just as much. Uh, you're in Hebrews 10. I think I turned, I told you I'm going to confuse myself, turning between two pages here. Page 1115 in the Schofield Reference Bible. I'm going to read a little bit about grace as recorded by Schofield. And we're going to end with this one because this is serious. We're messing with salvation here. Salvation. This is a big deal, folks. So how in the world could independent fundamental Baptist churches be believing that people were one time saved by their works and that they will be again in a seven-year tribulation period, which that's, again, not Bible. How do people even get that thought? Well, here's, a, here's one big reason. The Schofield Reference Bible notes. Listen to what he writes. Grace, summary. Do you love the grace of God, by the way? Do, you under, do we understand it enough to love it? It means God favors us and we don't deserve any of it. We don't deserve any. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound. It saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. It was blind, but now I see. I'm not saved by any work I've ever done or ever will do. Nobody's ever been saved by a work. Nobody ever can be saved by their works. 
but by the finished work of Jesus Christ. So, again, here's the danger. Schofield gets some of this right and some of it very wrong. Grace is the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man. I agree. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. I agree. It is therefore constantly set in contrast to law. I agree. Now here's where the problem begins. Under which God demands righteousness from man. Now let me explain that. What he's saying is, there was a time where God was looking to get righteousness from man, and that's how they can be saved, during the period of law. Can I tell you something? Romans 3.10 was as true in the Old Testament as it's true today. There is none righteous, no, not one. Romans 3.12, let me read on. Um, he demands righteousness from man. As under grace, he gives righteousness to man. Yes, he gives righteousness. That's right. Law is connected with Moses and works. Were people saved by works in the Old Testament? Never. Never. So what's the problem with that? It distorts the grace of God. It distorts what real grace and real salvation is. Folks, okay, how many gospels are there? Oh, there's multiple gospels. No, no, there's one but guess where you'll get the idea there's multiple Gospels? Schofield's reference notes. That's where that came from, folks. It didn't come from the Bible. It did not come from the Bible. It came from Schofield's reference notes. There's one Gospel. There's the everlasting Gospel. And it is the Gospel of the grace of God. And it is the Gospel that Paul preached. It's all the above. It's all the above. Law blesses the good Oh, but I'm reminded of another verse, Romans 3, 12, which actually he's quoting from Old Testament as well that says there's none that doeth good, no, not one. And in that same Old Testament, it says we are all as an, a, a, a filthy rags. All our righteousnesses are filthy rags. Law blesses the good. Grace saves the bad. Law demands that blessings be earned. Be earned. So anybody who was saved in the Old Testament, they earned it. They earned it. That's what he just said. Do you, have you earned any blessings from God? I, I haven't. He doesn't owe me anything. I deserve hell. That's what I deserve. Jesus deserves all blessing and honor and glory and power. All! I don't deserve any, but I have his imputed righteousness. Law demands that blessings be earned. Grace is a free gift. Grace is a free gift. As a dispensation, and you won't read that in the Bible, you'll read that in Schofield's notes, grace begins with the death and resurrection of Christ. Oh, no, no. No, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. That old drunkard after the ark, not promoting that, I'm just saying, he, he didn't earn that. How was, he, how was Noah saved? By faith, same way we are. By grace through faith, same way. The point of testing, don't miss these words, because they matter in what Schofield is thinking. The point of testing is no longer legal obedience as the condition of salvation. What does that mean? It means it used to be. Used to be if you obeyed, followed God's law, that's how you could be saved. But acceptance or rejection of Christ with good works is a fruit of salvation. Folks, nobody ever has or ever will be saved by works. Ever. Ever. Hebrews 10, we're going to be done with this. I, I could go on and on and on. We have to go home. I know. But I simply want to make the point very clearly tonight. This is a dangerous, dangerous study Bible. The, these are not the inspired words of God. Schofield's words are not the inspired words of God. They're not. And a lot of what folks believe come from Schofield's notes, not the Scripture. Hebrews 10, verse 1, we're going to read 14 verses that follow. It says, the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year continually, make the comers thereunto perfect. Never. For then would they not have ceased to be offered? 
because that the worshipers once purged should have had no more conscience of sins. But in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he, that's our Savior, cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice, sacrifice and offering thou wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. Why did God, the Spirit, God who is a spirit, why did he come to this earth and take on himself a body to pay the price for our sins? To hang on that old rugged cross for me, for you. Verse 6, in burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast had no pleasure. Then I said, lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above, when he said, sacrifice and offerings and burnt offerings and offering for sin thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that he may establish the second. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Once for all. O brother, believe it. Once for all, O sinner, receive it. Cling to the cross, the burden will fall. Christ hath redeemed us once for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever. Do you see that? Forever. Oh no, folks aren't going to be saved a different way in the future. And they weren't saved a different way in the past. They were saved by grace through faith looking ahead to God's plan, God's sacrifice. Remember when in Abraham was offering Isaac, he said, In the mount of the Lord it shall be seen. Remember in Genesis 3.15 when he said, The seed of the woman is going to bruise and destroy Satan. Who's he talking about? Jesus Christ. He's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. This man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God from henceforth expecting till his enemies be made his footstool. For by one offering, and don't miss this, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. You know, I'm perfected forever. I'm eternally secure in Jesus Christ. Nothing in my hand I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. If you're saved, you're saved eternally because it didn't depend on your works, your effort. You didn't earn any blessings or salvation. Jesus earned it all for you. And you believed on him and you received salvation by grace through faith. Folks, this is a dangerous study Bible. It's dangerous. It's influenced a lot of churches. A lot of people have clung more to the notes in that book than to the word of God. I want to encourage you to renew your commitment. Renew your commitment to the word of God. Let's bow our heads together, please.